Hello everyone, I am the Commander Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Tavern. The Commander Tavern is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic the Gathering format. A Fly is a series where I review the latest release or upcoming set or product for any and all cards that might have some form of impact in Commander. A Fly is a sampling of several brews, so I will be sampling the digitally exclusive cards from Jumpstart Historic Horizons. For the foreseeable future, these cards won't ever be printed in paper, just like the previous Arena exclusive cards in Historic. That being said, this episode will simply be to discuss these very unique cards for those interested in playing them online in Cockatrice, X-Page, etc., or for those considering proxying them for their Commander Cube or for your playgroup if Rule Zero permits it. If you like any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description, it'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing which also helps out a lot. You can also join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Timer community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. This wouldn't be the first time Arena gets exclusive cards. It isn't even the first time Magic the Gathering gets digitally exclusive cards for their video games. The first time was with Micropose computer game and then once again with the Sega Dreamcast video game exclusive to Japan. I covered this topic over a year ago. You can find a video explaining all of those digital cards in the link above. So if you're curious as to what these cards are and how they function, check it out and then return here or you can check them out later. I'll also leave a link to it in the description. Wasi then designed another digitally exclusive card as a promo for Magic Online but it was banned from all formats, even having the line text of this card is banned right on it. Gleemox would thus be the first digitally exclusive card on a Watsi controlled virtual client. However, sometime after launching Arena, Watsi made some digitally exclusive cards. Before Jumpstart Historic Horizons, there were 23 digitally exclusive cards for Arena that are actually 100% viable in paper magic without any kind of logistical inconvenience. However, one example of why Watsi might continue this Hearthstone type of approach with Arena was already seen a long time ago with the card Soul Hunter Rakshasa. This Arena exclusive card, now legal in Historic and 100 card Historic Brawl, they didn't always have this oracle text you see printed here. In fact, this card was very different when it was first released as can be seen here. These two versions of Soul Hunter Rakshasa are completely different. For one thing, the original version, the one on the left, doesn't rely on the amount of swamps you control. It'll always deal 5 damage. That might seem weaker than the errata since it can potentially deal more damage if you have more than 5 swamps. However, notice the change in when it triggers its ability. In the original one, it just had to enter the battlefield. In the eroded version, it's when it enters the battlefield if you cast it from your hand, so you can't abuse it with blinking abilities. This change, while seeming slight, is actually a functionally different change. It's not an errata to make the card work like the other blunders on new cards. It's an errata that completely changes how the card works, similar to the functional errata Oubliette received in Double Masters. But that's a topic for them in the discussion. In any case, Oubliette proves that whilst he can't use the functional errata as an excuse to keep cards exclusive to Arena and never print them on paper, since they've already done it with plenty of other paper cards as recently as Double Masters. So that's already one baseless excuse. In any case, a quick Scryfall search will provide 23 cards that I see no reason for them not to be printed in some future core set, commander product, or other supplementary product if they didn't want them available for standard, pioneer, or modern. But I digress. In any case, this video is about the seemingly controversial batch of newest digital-only cards from the upcoming Jumpstart Historic Horizons expansion, exclusive to Arena. So let's check those out. As I mentioned in the intro, you can only really play these cards in 100 card Historic Brawl on Arena if you want to have some sense of playing them in a commander-like setting. However, you can also just use them on other online platforms like Cockatrice if your playgroup is okay with them. As of the recording of this video, you can use them in paper only if you proxy them though, so that might require a bit more conversing with your playgroup since you need their agreement on two aspects, non-legal cards and proxies. Likewise, you can proxy any of these to put into your commander cube or just include them in your commander cube if your cube is online and you don't need any permission or conversation to include them. It is your cube after all. If your commander cube is online, then it shouldn't be a problem including any card you want. Alright, so without further ado, let's analyze these cards for commander. Let's start with the cards that can work just fine on paper without jumping through any hoops. It's kind of surprising they're here since they just seem like more of the same type of arena exclusive cards previously released. This is because neither of them have an element of randomness nor have any of the new digital only mechanics such as perpetually, conjure, or seek. Sarkhan's Scorn has you keeping track of how many turns have passed in a game, which is super easy to do. And then that's the amount of damage this spell deals to a creature or planeswalker. This effect isn't the first time it's appeared in paper either. Control Wind Condition is another paper card that keeps track of the game's turns and even instructs you to do so in the reminder text, which again, is very simple to do. Skyshroud Ambush is just like any other fight spell except that we draw a card if our creature won the fight. 
While we still don't officially know what this means, it's safe to assume that it probably means that our creature survived the fight, while our opponent's creature dies because of it. Again, that's just speculation though. In terms of this card being only viable digitally, not at all. This card can easily be printed in paper. There are already so many instances that have creatures fight each other, so there's absolutely nothing special about this one. Subversive Acolyte is just like any other similar creature like Figure of Destiny, Warden of the First Tree, etc. However, you can only activate it once and then you choose which change it gets. Since this is not a perpetual change, if the Acolyte were to change zones, it once more has its original stats and creature types. Again, very easy to replicate on paper since there are other cards with similar effects. Pool of Vigorous Growth is perhaps my favorite card from these since it's an artifact version of the Momer Big Basic Format Vanguard card. Even though it doesn't have any of the digital-only mechanics from the set, it does have randomization that would require a computer to use. However, just because it requires a computer to use doesn't mean you can't use your smartphone to do so like you would for a card like Urza Academy Headmaster. Urza requires you literally go to a website to use the applet there to determine which random effect he'll have with his loyalty abilities. Therefore, it follows that the same can be done with Pool of Vigorous Growth. I suggest using Momer Generator which you can find for the link in the description. While this website is something you can easily look up online in your smartphone and use to create a copy token of the creature generated at random with the pertinent mana value. If you are playing online with something like Cockatrice, you can also give a link to the other players in order for them to see exactly what you got so as to bypass any allegations of cheating. As you can see, the website is very easy to use and is quite intuitive. So even if you proxy this to play in paper, you can just use your smartphone to determine which creature copy token you're creating with it. As for the other cards, we might have to get a bit creative. So let's start with the easiest ones, the Conjure Mechanic. This mechanic essentially creates a card, not just a token, but an actual card. Meaning that the card is now in the game and permanently stays in the game until it's over. It doesn't get added to your deck, but it won't cease to exist when it switches zones as a state-based action. As with the previously mentioned effects, not only is this nothing new, but it isn't anything that hasn't already been done on paper. Granted, it was predicted with the Mystery Booster playtest cards Bone Rattler, Time Sidewalk, and Gunk Slug. Whereas the first two create a quote-unquote card token of an already existing card such as Reassembling Skeleton and Time Walk, Gunk Slug creates a brand new card called Gunk. This card is a colorless sorcery with no mana cost and no other ability besides cycling. As it pertains to these three specific cards, the rules state that, unlike a normal token, a token card doesn't cease to exist in a zone other than the battlefield. It's both a token and a card. It can move between zones any number of times and continues to exist for the rest of the game. For these three cards, the token cards they create are considered tokens. But for the conjure mechanic, they are not considered tokens. This is an important distinction since some cards do interact specifically with tokens like Curiosity Crafter. And that isn't the only card either. So these playtest cards creating a card that has the token attribute is an important distinction. However, in terms of how they behave after being created, it's the same way the cards created with the conjure mechanic behave. In fact, some of these cards exist in paper. Further rules for them explain that if a token card is put into a hidden zone, you must use a supplementary token card with a magic card back to represent it. Since these don't exist yet, you may need to be creative. However, these supplementary token cards exist and have been printed so far in Zendikar Rising, Call Time, and Strixhaven. They're used as placeholders for modular double face cards. These are blank and have the official magic card back unlike the previously printed blank cards from the World Championship Gold Border decks. I mean, if you're playing with sleeves, it shouldn't matter. But in any case, to follow these rules to a T, you can use these placeholder cards as a solution to this. If we were to make gunk tokens for gunk slug, this is what it would look like. Granted, I did this in paint, but you can very easily just do this with a sharpie. But this is just proof of concept. So when we see a card like Boneyard Aberration, which is almost a functional reprint of Bone Rattler, we already know what to do. Just keep in mind that the cards conjured aren't token cards like how they're created by the Mystery Booster playtest cards. For all effects and purposes, it's just like having the card be created in the game. So you can very easily just use an actual copy of Reassembling Skeleton or create a Reassembling Skeleton out of these placeholder cards. In fact, this is pretty much the solution for all of these Conjure cards. Just either take the actual card or a placeholder card, sleeve it up, and put it in the appropriate zone. In the case of Boneyard Aberration, the three copies of Reassembling Skeleton go into your graveyard. Cure the Tides Fury, Shoreline Scout, and Winx T Trainer have us conjure the respective card into our hand. Not only is this easily achievable in paper, but in Cockatrice as well. Just make sure you uncheck the box that says Destroy Token when it leaves the table and put it into your hand. Cockatrice makes an exact copy of the card, so we're good here. Cure is actually a very good Planeswalker card with some amazing art, so it's kind of a bummer it's only available in Arena. There are other cards in the set that conjure cards, but we'll see them in other sections since they also dabble with the other mechanics. 
One final note on the Conjure mechanic is that it's not a wish effect. Conjure isn't like Companion either. The computer is literally creating the card in-game and not pulling it out of your sideboard. So if you do get the green light from your playgroup to run these cards, you can technically win with Battle of Wits, if you're able to conjure enough cards and then shuffle them into your library. It'll be quite the ordeal but very rewarding to say you finally won a commander game with Battle of Wits. The only thing you really have to worry about with conjuring cards in a paper game of Magic is remembering to remove them from your deck afterwards. But if Battle of Wits were programmed for Historic, then it would definitely be possible to win a 100 card Historic Brawl match with Battle of Wits. Now let's see the cards that have the Perpetually mechanic. These aren't the only ones though, these are simply the only ones that have only the Perpetually mechanic so as to explain it in a vacuum. That way we can understand the mechanic, see if it can be applied in paper, and then analyze which cards are even worth including in a commander cube, or which ones you'd run in paper if your playgroup decided to proxy them. Perpetually is a very easy mechanic to understand. It literally changes the card regardless of which zones it changes to, where it is in the game, etc. The effect is, well, perpetual. So unlike a counter or static effect, the card permanently gains the effect. This isn't the first time WotC dabbled with perpetually changing a card via a modal option. During the Hero's Path events in the original Theros block, specifically Journey into Nyx, you got a Hero Equipment card in your pre-release kit. Depending on which color you were devoted to was the card you received within. Then, participating in the LGS events, you would collect stickers to put on a sheet to then unlock an enhancement sticker that would go in the empty space in the Hero Equipment's text box. This sticker was forging a God Slayer. However, this enhanced equipment could only be used when facing challenge decks. Even though this is similar to the perpetual mechanic, since these stickers are permanently placed on the card, they don't change or get removed after the game is over. With the perpetual mechanic, those effects are removed when the game ends. Looking at the cards with this effect, let's start with Baffling Defenses and Davriel's Withering. If these hit a commander, that commander is essentially ruined for the rest of the game since they will keep this effect even if they change zones. It remains until the end of the game. So if you cast Baffling Defenses at an opponent's commander, since it's on the battlefield, that commander will essentially have base power 0 for the rest of the game. So unless they somehow pump it up, that commander will never deal commander damage, which is one of the main aspects of commander and brawl. Davriel's Withering is worse since it perpetually gives negative toughness. If it hits any commander with a base toughness 2 or less, that commander will essentially never remain on the battlefield unless the opponent is somehow running toughness boost effects. So there's a reason why this was banned in 100 card historic brawl before the set was even released. So if you're proxying these cards for a commander cube, I'd stay away from them and exclude them altogether. It's why I don't run look at me on the DCI in my commander cube. The commander doesn't even need to be on the battlefield as a target. You just name the commander and then it's removed from the game. Then the player can't play it until a new game is made. Yes, it costs 7 mana to do so, but that's something that can realistically be achieved as early as turn 4 in the right deck. The rest of them are pretty tame and can very easily be achieved in paper. All you need to do is write the change on a small piece of paper, put the paper in the sleeve, and that's it. The next time the card appears, comes out, is played, etc., the change will be clearly visible. So this one is also easily achievable. Even if someone cheated, you'd be able to tell. What you can do is simply have another player write it so it's in their handwriting and then place it in the sleeve. You don't even need to look at the card to put the piece of paper in the sleeve. Thus, you're able to maintain the identity of the card hidden if it's in a hidden zone like a player's hand. So, let's evaluate them in color order. Manalash Polarson is pretty tame and would make a great inclusion in cycling matters decks like Gabby Nest Warden and the like. You cycle it away, draw a card, and then the next time you cycle a card, you basically pay its casting cost and then reanimate it tapped with a perpetual plus one plus zero boost. This allows for plenty of recursion hijinxes, especially with sacrifice outlets, cycling things for free, etc. And then you get an inevitably huge beater with lifelink. Leolin Sanctifier is also pretty tame, but pretty good since it gives a creature in your hand lifelink perpetually. Since this triggers when it enters the battlefield, you can potentially reuse this with blinking effects. Even though this creature is in a hidden zone, it doesn't matter. Just put the creature face down on the battlefield, have an opponent write lifelink on a piece of paper, put it in the sleeve without revealing the card, and then have the player return it to their hand. This is not difficult to do in paper. What do you need? A pen and some paper? Moving on. Lumbering Light Shield provides a nice stacks effect since it perpetually makes a random card in your opponent's hand cost one more to cast. As with Leonian Sack to Fire, this is affecting a card in a hidden zone. No problem, just have your opponent place their hand face down on the table, choose a card at random from it, then write the perpetual effect on a piece of paper, put it in the sleeve, then have the player pick it up and put it in their hand again. It's not rocket science. Since this effect is when it enters the battlefield, this is another creature that would be great in a blinking deck. Going on to blue, we have Ethereal Grasp. This one is also mean against commanders. Not as mean as Baffling Defenses and certainly not as mean as Davriel's Withering, but you get the gist. If it hits a commander, it'll be incredibly taxing to untap it since it won't untap during any untap step. If you want to untap it, you have to pay a whopping 8 mana to do so. 
However, if you include it in your deck to hit your own commander or creature that can tap for the more than 8 mana, you can use this to generate infinite mana. For example, targeting your own Circle of Dreams Druid when you control more than 8 creatures means that you'll inevitably generate infinite green mana, so it's a pretty solid card both for your benefit or an opponent's detriment. Mentor of Evo's Isle is similar to Leonin's Sactifier, but it perpetually grants flying instead of lifelink. On its own, it's pretty weak, and you're basically playing 3 mana to perpetually give flying to some creature in your hand. However, in a similar deck, like a blinking deck, you can reuse its trigger and perpetually give flying to multiple creatures in your hand. Playcrafters Familiar has another similar effect but with Death Touch. The best creature in your hand to give this to would be one with First Strike or Double Strike. It's not that expensive to cast at 2 mana, plus it has Death Touch of its own. That being said, you would need to have an ideal creature already in your hand to make the most of its ability, so it might require a bit of patience to use so keep that in mind. Very rarely do we want cards in our hand doing nothing in a magic game. Moving on to red we have Reckless Ringleader, the red creature of this cycle, this one providing Perpetual Haste. Perpetual Haste for just one red mana makes this possibly the best one of the cycle, especially since it has a relevant creature type. If you have a goblin deck and something like Krenko Mod Boss in your hand, then for just one red mana you gave Krenko Perpetual Haste and your opponents don't even know it yet. Once you cast Krenko and they see the piece of paper in another player's handwriting, they'll see just how busted a hasty Krenko could be, especially since you'll always have it until the end of the game. Just ensure you remove all the pieces of paper from your sleeves when the game ends. Mana Gorger Phoenix is interesting because it gets counters put on it when it's in the graveyard. This isn't anything different though. Skullbriar the Walking Grave also keeps its counters when it's everywhere except the library or a hand. So the Phoenix having flame counters on it while it's in the graveyard isn't impressive anytime soon. However, when it gets 5 or more this way, it reanimates itself with a perpetual plus 1 plus 1. Since it changes zones, it does lose its flame counters, but at least it keeps the plus 1 plus 1. It's definitely an interesting creature, since it's a 2-2 flyer for 2 mana that could potentially get bigger and bigger the more a game progresses and prizes you for running a very heavily red deck. Sign of Shiv is a more straightforward than that though. It's a 3-3 flyer already passing the vanilla test, and it has perpetual fire breathing. It does cost a whopping 3 mana with each activation, but it's an amazing mana sink, especially when done at the end of the turn before yours. Static Discharge isn't the first spell to get counters on it while it's on the stack. Lightning Storm already did this in 2006. However, unlike Lightning Storm, Static Discharge gains a perpetual charge counter as well as all cards named Static Discharge in your hand, library, and graveyard. However, as cool as this effect is, Commander is a singleton format, so running it is a bit moot. Finally in green, Long Tusk Stalker and Veteran Charger perpetually pump a creature in your hand. Veteran Charger is the green creature of the cycle while Long Tusk Stalker works with energy counters. So not only is the cat a great way to accumulate energy counters, but is a great energy counter outlet in order to perpetually pump creatures in your hand. The next mechanic is practically impossible to do in paper and potentially not even worth the time to do so, and that's Seek. Seek is a card search mechanic that searches through a player's library for a random card that complies with some specific parameters and then puts it into the player's hand without shuffling their library afterward. The only possible way to achieve this in paper is having some impartial person not playing the game to perform the computer's function. Even then, if the person had to choose between a random subset of cards, they'd have to randomize that list, choose the card from the result, and then return the library as is without shuffling it afterwards. These cards, Bounty of the Deep, Manor Guardian, Sky Shroud Lookout, and Faceless Agent aren't even that bad. But Bounty of the Deep is one that would work even without having to reveal your hand since the computer would know if you have a land card or not. This is where the impartial extra person would come in. They look at the hand, sees if they have a land or not, then seeks through the library for all cards that meet whichever criteria is given. These cards are then randomized and the two results code to the player's hand and then the library stays as is. This would be the only way to algorithmically imitate in paper what the computer does digitally. So as cool as these cards are, I would steer clear of attempting to play with them outside of Arena unless you really want to go through all this work which quite honestly is going to solve the game much faster than cracking a fetch land or resolving a tutor. Especially Mana Garden dying since each player gets to seek for a non-land card with mana value 2 or less. So unless you have only one card that meets this criteria, I'd say skip on these even if you have an online queue. This mechanic can't really work on Cockatrice without some convoluted, time-consuming workaround either. It reminds me of Aswan Jaguar and Pandora's Box. When the Jaguar enters the battlefield, some impartial person from outside the game will have to look at an opponent's decklist, then choose a random creature type from among them with some random number generator, and then apply it to Aswan Jaguar's ability. At least this one doesn't require someone looking through a library as is, just going through the opponent's deck, which means their entire deck, not just their library. And that could be done via any decklist. Pandora's box functions in the same way. The impartial person looks through all players' deck lists, possibly a list on a website, then using a randomness generator, chooses a random creature that way. Then the rest of the card's process can continue as to whether or not the player gets the token copy. 
so this could even copy a commander or companion since they're technically part of the deck. Now let's look at cards that have more than one of these mechanics. Tome of the Infinite is pretty straightforward. You pay one blue, tap it, and then it conjures a random card into your hand, this card being either one of from this list. However, this random card isn't revealed when it's conjured, it's simply chosen at random and put into its controller's hand. Therein lies the problem, how do you know that player wasn't cheating? Although this effect is very doable, you'd need an impartial person outside of the game to determine which card is being chosen and thus conjured. That way it remains hidden information without any kind of cheating. And even then the card gets a perpetual change, you can use any mana of any color to cast it. So a piece of paper stating that would have to go in its sleeve when it's conjured. So as cool as this artifact is, it might be too much effort to make it worth including in a commander cube. Davriel's Soul Broker is a crazy card. His first ability is pretty tame and a decent enough way to protect himself and other planeswalkers you control. But his second ability makes him seem more like Urza Academy Headmaster. However, unlike Urza and Mormorvik Basic, you can't really go to a website to randomize his effects. However, you can go to any choice randomization website or app and plug in these options so as to get three of them. Once you get three random options from this list, an opponent chooses one. Then you do the same for his conditions. Once you get three random options from this list, an opponent chooses one and thus they get their offer and condition. Since these are random, you can potentially put an opponent in a very precarious position, but likewise give them an amazing offer with a manageable condition. So it's all left to chance, which is still pretty fun if you like these kind of effects. However, even with all that, I wouldn't run Davriel in a commander cube due to his final ability. Just as with Davriel's Withering, his ultimate can hit a commander when it's on the battlefield and potentially take them entirely out of the game for the rest of the match. Both Davriel and Davriel's Withering are banned in 100 card historic brawl for this very reason. I also recommend not running these in a commander type setting. Sarkhan Wanderer to Shiv is another planeswalker with multiple mechanics. His first ability perpetually makes the dragon cards in your hand cost one less to cast and you can pay generic mana to cast them. Keep in mind that since this is affecting a hidden zone, you might want an opponent to write down these changes on the piece of paper to put it into your sleeves to prevent any accusations of cheating. His zero loyalty ability is pretty good since it conjures a shivan dragon into your hand. This makes Sarkhan a decent engine on his own. If you already have dragons in your hand, keep spamming his plus one until they're essentially free. If you don't have dragons in your hand and need creatures to put down, activate his zero ability. His minus two helps protect him from decently sized creatures since he does cost four to cast. So there will inevitably be some potential attackers in the early game that might go to him. But honestly, I just use Sarkhan in a dragon tribal deck because he's just so good there. And best of all, totally viable in paper. Also, even though he's more for tribal synergy, something that requires too much dedication in a cube, he can still work on his own because his second ability puts dragons in your hand that can use his first ability for. So he can essentially still work outside of dragon decks if you really want him in your commander cube that doesn't have tribal archetypes like mine does. Tayo Aegis Adept, yet another planeswalker with multiple digitally exclusive mechanics, has some tame abilities. His plus one is a perpetual effect easy enough to pull off since it's on a card publicly visible to everyone. His minus two conjures a lumbering light shield onto the battlefield. Notice that this is not creating a copy of it, so the card can be bounced, blinked, etc. and it won't suffer like tokens would. His emblem is amazing in the right deck especially since you can do some pretty busted reanimation hijinxes even if you leave him in mono white. As far as commander cubes go, he can definitely find a home in one considering how simple he is to pull off in paper or even on cockatrice. Freely's Skyshout Protestant, the final planeswalker with multiple mechanics and the final card in this flight, has all three digitally exclusive mechanics. She's potentially the most difficult one to pull off in paper since you're going to need an impartial person for two of her three abilities as we've already seen with the seek mechanic and with giving perpetual effects to cards in hidden zones. While I have no doubt she'll be amazing in an elf tribal deck, in a commander cube without elf tribal support, it makes no sense to run her there anyways. Thus concludes this flight of cards from yet another subset of magic cards only available digitally twice on arena if you're keeping track. Apart from the cards that seek or require an impartial person from outside of the game, at least most of these are actually doable in paper with the right playgroup. So if you want to proxy them and rule zero of them with your playgroup, hopefully this video helped you get an idea of how to put it off or if you want to proxy them for your commander cube. If your commander cube is something you draft and play online, then most of these effects are even easier to pull off in Cockatrice, X-Mage, etc. Hopefully Wizards with one day print every card that was once only available digitally, even if they're not legal anywhere outside of Kitchen Table Magic, Limited, or Cube. They already print silver bordered cards which aren't legal anywhere, as well as playtest cards in Mystery Booster which also aren't legal anywhere. And not only that, some of those mechanics were already similar to the ones seen in Jumpstart Historic Horizons anyways. 
Honestly, if Wizards prints a product that only had the Astral cards, Sega Dreamcast cards, all the digitally exclusive Arena cards from now and then, and Gleemox, I would buy it in an instant. My cube craves the jank and the rarities. Again, even if they're banned in all paper formats, print them. Not being legal in any format doesn't prevent them from printing silver bordered products. I want to take this opportunity to thank my patrons by giving a shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for the patronage. I also want to thank all those who've liked, shared, commented, and subscribed so far to my channel. My continued growth is thanks to your support. I also want to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link. That also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of A Flight on the Commander Tavern. I am the Meta Kirby, and happy theory crafting.